guys, I want to, I got a special guest with me today, uh, Jerry Akers. A lot of you probably know him. So I'd like to welcome you first to the, another episode of the advisory board podcast. And Great uh, to be here. Oh, thanks, Jerry. Yeah. So let me tell you about Jerry, guys. If, if you don't know him or you don't know him well, uh, Jerry's a bit of what I'd consider a true rock star. That gets thrown around a lot, but let's, let me tell you why. He's been in business for 35 years. He's been a f- franchise owner for at least 17 years. Uh, he's now a, a multi-state, multi-brand, multi-unit franchise owner. Uh, and there's some, there are a lot of unique things about Jerry we're going to talk about. Not just his baseball history. We won't go in that, down that rabbit hole together, Jerry. Maybe some other time. We'll have to do a podcast about like life lessons and franchising from baseball. I'll help you co author Excellent. But he's also a best-selling author. Uh, and, and that's not a joke. That's a, he's a real, the real deal guy. So uh, lots of experience and wisdom here. And uh, Jerry, what else should we know about you before we jump into the topic today? Well, you know, what you should know about me is that what the topic is today is really is what has driven me through this entire process. Mm-hmm. I've spent most of my career in business helping others find a higher level of performance and uh, more success because I've always from day one looked at the fact that an employer has the opportunity to positively impact hundreds or thousands of lives through their employees and their spouses and their families and those kinds of things. So uh, when you talk about the real deal and I'm not patting myself on the back, you can ask anybody that's ever worked with me or for me. And it's always about what goes on in their world and how we intersect that with the business world. Mm -hmm. I love that, Jerry. Um, That that is, by the way, you know, the topic of, of the discussion today is, is how do we create a people first business, uh, which which seems foreign to, to your hardcore business guy. This cuts against the grain pretty hard. Uh, there are books out, bestseller books, you know, profit first, right? Uh, right. But there's, I would say for every one book like that, that was written in the 70s or written by someone who was born in the 50s um, and hasn't hasn't been in, in a good experience where they've, they've seen the impact of culture. There are probably four or five books now that are bestsellers about culture first and people first and actually not a lot of people first but a lot of culture first type books well yeah you know all of those are great in book format but you still have to put them in place and you still have to make a profit at the end of the day to stay around and continue to impact other people's lives i mean my involvement with putting people first goes all the way back to when i worked in corporate america and i worked in many businesses that read those books about profit first right and uh Um, I would come in and start changing the way the company looked at their employees Mm -hmm. and get a lot of pushback from the owners or upper management Mm -hmm. and literally beg forbearance until I got my legs under me and we had a chance to really see what the impact was going to be. But some of the results of that were phenomenal, Dave, with increased performance, longevity of the employees, happiness, which leads to even saying better things to clients and so on, which leads to more business. I mean, it becomes a cascading effect once you get it started and the employees believe that you really stand for it. Yeah. I I worked in an industry before the certification training, you know, L and D industry. One of the things that we, we stumbled upon as we were trying to validate what we did there, you know, getting industry certifications into career programs and investing in your people was that was the expense of, of churn of losing people. That's one thing that a lot of businesses, they, they look at people, and I think the market has shifted because there aren't enough people willing to work right now, but by, by default, but before, before the economy and the marketplace shifted people's thinking about it, uh, real, real leaders were noticing if I can retain my people and I can retain the right people, because a lot of times businesses are like, oh no, we, we, we don't turn too much, we keep people. The problem is if you've got the wrong type of culture, you retain all the wrong people. And then, then you start to create a, a negative cycle that kind of self-perpetuates. Well, and to that point, if you're keeping the wrong people, the good people leave because they don't want to hang out uh, at an employer or with people that are the wrong people. So you're right. And, you know, the wrong people stay for the wrong reasons. Uh, many of them just want a stable job where they can show up and collect their paycheck. And for any of us that have a people first type mindset or any of us that own businesses where your employees are in front of uh, clients all day long. You, you need to have happy people. You need to have people that believe in the company and who they work for. And yeah. you know, you're only going to get so much of that with a paycheck. You've got to do it in other ways. Mm-hmm. And so that's what I saw way back 30 years ago as I was starting to help build corporate businesses was that you know it was easy to keep the wrong people. It was difficult to keep the right people. But then yeah. when you boiled it down, 
it wasn't that di difficult to keep the right people because they were all looking for things that arguably an employer should be giving them already. For instance, education for upward mobility, which costs next to nothing. Mm -hmm. You can do yeah. a lot of that internally, right? Giving them opportunities to grow with you, not just to leave you and go somewhere else to find something better to grow with you. That doesn't cost anything. So, I mean, there was a lot of low hanging fruit that didn't cost very much, but actually led to your better people choosing to stay with you long term for those opportunities. Yeah. And let's let's break that down a little bit, Jerry, because I, I love that. And I think that you're spot on. Uh, and I have seen that the wrong people stay for the wrong reasons. And sometimes having people transition out of an organization is one of the best things you can do for the, their peers, even their direct reports, their uh, the company as a whole. So um, let's let's break that concept down, though. So keeping the right people, you talked about two things are education. And you talked about providing opportunities for upward mobility. And I want to localize this for a minute. Let's talk in the franchising uh, context for a minute. Let's talk about your franchising concept for a minute. You're, you know, you've got 36 great clips across a couple of states. Um, I see, you know, like, uh, and, and forgive me, because I would call them, would you call them hairdressers or cosmetologists? Hairstylists. Hairstylists. Thank you. I was like, I know there's a word and I'm going to botch this. So I, <laughs> I botched it. So uh, hairstylists and upward mobility it feels like a pretty small scale where they can grow. So I'm curious, like, if you don't mind, share some insights with us, like, sure. how do you operationalize this concept with Great Clips as a, as a multi-unit franchise owner? You know, the thing is, the hairstylists, in fact, many of them come from difficult backgrounds, different, difficult educational and family backgrounds and things like that. So mm -hmm. the thing that I learned early on was they just need a little bit. They don't need a lot. They just need a little bit of hope and a little bit of support and a little bit of faith and those kinds of things. So early on, you know, you need you need a hierarchy of management as you grow across a very large cross section of units. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, yeah. you know, you need managers and assistant managers of the local, but you also need maybe regional managers or area managers. and You need some general managers, whatever. So as we grew, we had some of those opportunities coming up, but yeah. we did not have enough of them to create a really great buzz with the, basically the line level of mm -hmm. hairstylists in all of these salons. But what we ended up doing was we, we kind of manufactured positions and responsibilities. So we would discover that people had a love of uh, reaching out to recruit or reaching out to uh, be in the, in the cosmetology schools to talk about the opportunities or something like that. So we would, when we discovered that, we allowed them to be part of our team that would go in and do those kinds of things. They looked at it as a promotion. They got a different title. They got a few cents an hour to do it or something like that. But it wasn't about that. It was about the pride they had. And they could go back to a school where they graduated a few years ago maybe not always under the best of circumstances or the best of reputations. And they go back and they dress to the nines. They go in with their hair and their makeup perfect. And they go in like a rock star. They want to own that school and show them that they came out of that school under maybe questionable circumstances. And now they're working for an employer that gave them the bandwidth to grow and perform at a different level. And they walk in like they own it. They do presentations that just grab you know, those, those soon to be graduates attention and, and get them excited to work for somebody who did that with that person. You yeah. know what I mean, Dave? Oh yeah. That's actually fantastic. And, and tell me about the impact. So, so these young ladies, I'm assuming, and maybe there's some young men too. I don't, it's I, about 95% young yeah. ladies. Sure. I, but I feel like I'm stereotyping when I say that, right? Generally. I know. Yeah. So, but let, so the, these hairstylists, what is the impact to them on, let's talk about a couple of things that we don't normally talk about in business. What about self-esteem? What does it sure. do for them financially? And what does it do for them as they interact with their peers, right? And the organization, what do you see? Well, um, first off, let's talk about the peers component. The peers notice the changes in these people. And they notice that somebody who came in, maybe just barely hanging on to their job is now performing at a different level. Uh -huh. So then there wants to, you know, they start wondering how did that person change and why did they change and what's in it for me? That's what it really comes down to. Right. Yeah. But the bottom line is it starts raising the bar of the way that you look and the way that you act and those kinds of things when you're in on the floor of the salon. Yeah. So so that's the first thing. It raises the bar and it raises uh, everybody's expectations of themselves as far as how they look and how they act and those kinds of things. And then you mentioned 
you know, they're more sure of themselves. Well, when you're in a business at, like the hairstylists are where tipping is part of it and p- performance bonuses may be part of it, mm-hmm. your effectiveness and your efficiency becomes a part of your pay. So here's what happens when those people, because they became uh, much more self-assured and they started taking better care of themselves and looking better, the tips go up. So they raise their income by 20% in some cases simply oh. by looking and dressing better and feeling better about themselves. And there's some methods that we have in our organization that allows them to see that trend that happens when they make those changes and make the connections to you know, how their income started going up. And again, cycle back to the other, their peers who are not performing at that level, they see the income go up. And of course they wanna be in that position. So then it continues to raise the bar. All of that makes the group happier, which reflects back to the clients, which means we're getting more clients coming in the door because they want to know what's going on. This place used to be a little bit of a, you know, kind of a Debbie Downer when I walked in and now everybody's happy. They're excited to see the customers and they're getting a better experience. Yeah. Isn't that fascinating? And then, I mean, tell me a little bit about, because you've, you've bought existing units before too, haven't you? And turned them around. Can you, can you share an example of what was the net impact on it? Like, how long did it take to start to affect these changes? Because there's always, when there's a new boss, there's always the skepticism and people holding back, not willing to buy in. So there's this period of time, I think, where let's say you buy a, new, a unit that you're going to try to roll into your into your network and you're trying to get them on board with this. What have you seen? Like, how, how long does it typically take and what are the net results when you get something like this in place? Yeah, we usually see, usually within a month, we start to see some changes. And what usually has to happen is we have to prove to them that we're not just talking, we're actually performing. So I go in and sweep hair. I go in and I help them clean the bathroom or something. You know, I, I'm in there uh, talking to them so that they know that I'm engaged. And when I say I, we've now grown to the point where it may be one of my daughters that does it because they're closer to the involvement than I am now. But that's what we did back in you know, when my wife and I were first starting up. And then you find one champion, one person in there that really gets it. And you spend just, a, you know, they ask you to spend more time with them or they ask you to help them or whatever. And then you you kind of mold them and shape them and, and tweak them just a little bit by giving them, uh, by showing them how their opportunities would continue to grow if they made slight changes. And then they do that. And then they see the results that come out of it. And then it just kind of takes on an upward mobility type app, if you will, where they're they're continuing to go up and they literally raise the rest of the salon with them as they go up. So uh, what we have seen, uh, we've had uh, salons that we've bought that we've doubled the revenues in less than a year, simply by changing the atmosphere and the culture inside through the format we just talked about. Well, and let's talk about that for a minute. So you double revenues, <clears throat> most people, excuse me, <clears throat> most people would say, okay, but what happened to the, the top line expenses as you're doubling revenue as well? Sure. Tell me about they, that. Yeah. Our top line expenses went up almost nothing because they were already being paid. Um, you know, really where our expenses went up were related to performance-based or commission-based components. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And in my case, I have never looked at that as a, as a really a true overhead cost because they're getting a tiny fraction of yeah. whatever extra revenue came in based mm-hmm. on their performance. So yes, maybe on the PL it shows up that way, but in reality, we wouldn't have had that income if it wasn't for it. So literally our costs went up tiny amounts. Like, yeah. you know, we would clean up the salon. We would maybe add a little bit of new equipment. We might do a little paint, you know, to really freshen the place up. So they feel like they're working in a, a newer, more upbeat place. But again, those are pennies in the course of an annual budget for something like that. So it cost us very little. And most of it was driven by in-person or video type conversations like we're doing today. Yeah, I, I love that. Well, especially when you get 36 units, now that becomes a bit untenable to be in, in, the, in the, the store all the time, meeting with people. But time, time is the thing that I keep hearing from you, Jerry. And it's not just time in general. You can, there are a lot of folks, like when I go to restaurants uh, and and the, there's, there are two different types of managers. They're the ones that are there because it's their job. And, and maybe this is unfair. And they're the ones that are there because they really genuinely enjoy what they do. Right. And the difference, they'll come, the one that's, a, it's a job. He, is, he or she is required to stop by every table and ask them how their meal was, right? You, can, you know, it's a mechanism they use. And I see it all the time. And, and sometimes like, how was your meal tonight? Was everything good? Okay, great. And they're on to the next table. And there are the other ones who are like, hey, how was your meal tonight? And they wait yeah. for the answer. And so time 
the, they're doing the same thing in the same context all the time. And it's obvious to me who gives a crap and who doesn't. And as a customer, it's almost a deterrent. I'm like, I was enjoying my meal. And then you came in and interrupted me while I was talking right. to my wife. Um, and you didn't even care. You were just checking a box. So that, that I think is kind of the key here. Because the people will say, well, I spend time with my people. But it's not changing anything. Can you help us break that down? Like, what's the difference? And I'm sure you've done it both ways before. You grew up in corporate America. So you've done it wrong, guaranteed, before. Not that all corporate America is broken. But what's the difference in the way that you engage people when you're spending time with them? You know, it, it's first off your heart and where you come from. You know, when you when you really show that you stand for what you're trying to get them to work towards, they they buy into it. So when they would see us uh, work very hard with a, a struggling employee, because the other employees are watching, right? And everybody knows what everybody's life is like. And if yeah. you've got somebody who's having struggles at home, and you come in and say, "Listen, just." just go home today and take care of what's going on at home. We got you covered today. Um, I, I don't want you to be here when you need to be taking care of that. We'll, we'll cover for you. And then others start to see that if you did it for that person, you're going to do it for them when they're in that situation. And here's what happens. And this is where the magic really happens. Then they start filling in for each other. Instead of as an employer, I have a hard time keeping a salon open because we don't have enough employees because one person got sick. Suddenly, because of the culture that we build around what I just said, they uh, they start saying, listen, I, I'm off today. Let me come in. I'll trade with you. I'll take your shift. You take mine next week and we'll call it good. Go take care of your sick kid or whatever the case might be. So, again, that comes back to what we spoke about earlier was culture. So when they know, you know, I've gone in before when we only had, we don't believe we should have only one employee in there at a time. We believe it's not safe and secure. So yeah. we refuse to do that. There yeah. are other employers that don't they because of cost they only want one in there well and then sometimes something bad does happen to that employee right so they saw me early on when um they were in that situation and i drop what i was doing and drive to that location just to sweep air and check people in and fold laundry or whatever it took because they knew i wasn't going to let them be there alone so i was truly concerned with their safety and security and yeah. I was um, actually out there doing some of the work to help them keep moving and so on. Yeah. So again, it just shows that as an employer, it's not just about the bottom line, it's about you. And we just continued to build on that, Dave. I mean, we provide benefits that you don't see, especially in the world of hairstyling, you just don't see very often. Yeah. And it is just who we are. We believe we need to take care of those people. And that has turned into uh, longevity, uh, more loyalty and actually more effect, uh, effectiveness and efficiency in how they work when they become more loyal and longer term employees, which is kind of how we pay for it. Yeah. Well, let's talk about this for a minute. <clears throat> so in your industry in particular, but I think in most industries, especially where there's a consumer service that might be re repeated, let's say home cleaning and maid services, or let's say uh, dog care, or let's say uh, even elderly care, things like that, where there's going to be some sort of a recurring service. You know, painting, roofing, window washing would be another good one. Carpet cleaning. Those are all good examples. Maybe not some of the big capital expenses, but um, there is a relationship that's being developed with the customer, right? right? Especially in your industry. I know this is critical. If you have <clears throat> happy people, then customers come back. And when they've come back a couple of times, it becomes a habit and they always want to have Martha cut their hair. Or right. Steve, it could be Steve too, right? But you know, the uh, but when that happens, and then you have a longevity issue, then somebody transitions to another salon. A book of business leaves with that 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 hairstylist. Is this is this a fair representation of how that works? It can, um, and we are we are happy uh, to let people know where that stylist went because that's also a part of being a you know a good provider. I think. Um, we hope that she just transferred to another one of our salons. So, you know, we don't, we don't lose the revenue, but the fact is if they go somewhere else, people are going to find her sooner or later, anyhow. And if you hold back on that, they're, they're probably going to take it out on you in the long run. Anyhow, what in yeah. reality we've found in our model is that most of those people live and work fairly close to that salon. Mm -hmm. And if they've been in there multiple times, they've probably had to take a different stylist when Martha or Steve was on vacation or sick or whatever. So they've yeah. got a plan B and they really like coming to that salon. So as much as they love Martha or Steve, most of them are not going to drive across town to find them. They're going to try and stay close by. But again, 
if Martha or Steve is the only positive one, the only friendly one, the only one that provides great service in that salon, then they're going to go somewhere else. So really there's a vested interest for us to make sure that everybody is doing as well as they possibly can. So if a client is in that situation, they've got options. Yeah. I love it. You know, one thing you mentioned earlier, I want to come back to, and actually before I move on, the reason I brought that up was just because of, of revenue, right? Like I want to keep trying, tying this back into, you know, the hardcore business people that, that maybe haven't caught the vision of how culture and taking care of people actually create, creates profits, people, sure. people before profits, and then you get profits. It's kind of this weird equation. that seems counterintuitive, but that's where I was kind of going with that is if you have churn, you know, and you'll have churn and I, and I'm grateful to hear you say like, Hey, we, if they want an opportunity, they're going to go be a regional somewhere else, like upward mobility. I feel the same way. I always tell my, my folks, I want you to grow. And if I can't grow you to the next stage, then, then I want you to go. I had someone who got this great promotion out of our sales org. His aunt had a connection, pulled him in this huge company, great salary, great benefit, all this stuff that he wanted. He was just out of college. And I said, look, I don't have a budget for that. And yeah. I can't after they're providing because they're a $200 million company. I said, I want you to chase it. Like, I'm not going to hold you back. I'd feel guilty if I did. That's a great job. And we still keep in touch. He still, he plays hockey with our founder and they, there's like this great relationship at some point in the future while he's getting all this great training from someone else, we might have a position open. And I guarantee, I guarantee that type of a relationship would make him seriously consider coming to work for me again. Well, Dave, it goes so far back as to when I used to do presentations, recruiting presentations in the cosmetology schools, I would look around the room, room and I would tell the students, I would say, you may come to work for me. And because you have another opportunity in two or three years, you leave me. And that's OK, because I will feel like I have given you a great basis yeah. to create that that future for that you want to have. So if you want to open your own salon or if you want to go to work for a high end salon, more power to you. But you will sing my praises, not mm-hmm. only to everybody you come in contact with in your social life, but also to future hairstylists and people going to school, which will lead to me recruiting more people. And what ended up happening was they worked really hard when they worked for me, which created more revenue and more profit for the time that they were there. And when they left, yes, there a few clients would go with them, but they're going to charge twice as much at the next place than I am. So there's some of those trade-offs, you know? And yeah. if again, if we've got that culture, we're not going to miss a beat regardless, and they're going to sing our praises forever. Yeah, that, that's important. It's a reputation build. My gr- I was a bit of a hooligan growing up, and and my grandmother when she was when she was uh, ready to pass, I we went up to see her, and she she taps me on the face, and she goes, David, you look so handsome when you shave your face, because she didn't want to tell me she thought my facial hair looked terrible, and then she said, then she said, and watch your reputation, because I was kind of a hellion growing up, and I was causing trouble, and you know nothing too terrible, but you know got in some trouble. And so, but I always remember that. And it's so true in business, like your reputation in on online, your online reputation, that's a whole podcast, but your, your per, interpersonal relationship in the community you work in hairstylists, that's a pretty tight knit group of people, right? Same schools, same circles, same friends. So uh, you, you want to be cautious. You want to maintain that reputation. I love going in the world we're, the world we live in now, Dave, as well as you know, very well um, with social media and so on these hairstylists talk all the time even if they don't work at the same place they talk virtually and so if you don't treat your people right that's the message that's going to go out what my people say is when they go out to their social media they say oh my gosh look what my employers just did for me nobody else does that for their employers i'm so lucky to work at a place like this now that is a natural recruiting message that -hmm. goes out to their large audience whatever that might look like of which a portion of those are hairstylists that may be unhappy or unappreciated where they're at. So yeah. without an active recruiting uh, metric going along that lateral, if you will, it still turns into a very positive recruiting effort for us. Yeah. And are you asking your people to say that? No, gosh, no, yeah. no, no, no. We, um, so there's, there's really two veins there, uh, Dave. Um, number one, we do have an active social media recruiting group and a platform where they will go, um, they won't approach one person, but they will do some generic things saying, um, we're just, we're just uh, compiling uh, positive messages about why you work where you work. What, what is it that keeps you here? Those kinds of things. And those will come in and they'll turn into some kind of a message for recruiting. Those are ones that we really go after. But the ones that I'm talking about are, are and these are true stories. A hairstylist standing in front of a house 
with her kids, single mom, with a picture of her in her house saying, this is the first house my family has owned in three generations, and I bought it on a hairstylist income working for these people. They don't even have to say anything about why don't you work here or something like that, because the message yeah. is, yeah. if you're not getting that where you're working, you should be working over here. And you can fill in the blank with house, car, vacation, any of those kinds of things, because mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, there's a cross section of hairstylists that don't make a lot of income and feel trapped. And so these hairstylists are saying, I could have been you, but I'm not. Here's where I'm at. And the hidden message is come join us, right? Yeah. What, what I love, I was being facetious when I asked you if you asked your people to say that to their peers, because I already knew the answer knowing you that you would never <laughs> do anything that was that, that uh, disingenuous. But that, that's the thing. Like when we talk about culture and treating people right, organically things happen. And uh, where do your best employees come from, Jerry? Leading question that we didn't prep for. Are they coming from Indeed or they come from? No, no, actually, they come almost exclusively from word of mouth. Um, we get some by doing presentations in the cosmetology schools. So new graduates come and try us. We've actually got a program. Uh, it's our receptionist program. So we'll go to the schools and we'll uh, recruit. Most of those kids in cosmetology school need a part time job. So we invite them to be a part time receptionist for us with all the duties that go with that. And by the way, while you're a receptionist for us, when it's slow, our stylists are going to be training you in the back on a mannequin to do haircuts that you struggle with or anything that you might be, you know, having problems with. And what happens over the course of the six months they're a receptionist for us, most of them decide this is where they want to work. They don't want to go anywhere else because this is their family now. And they took good care of me when I was struggling and whatever the case might be. So without truly being aimed at a recruiting format, it's actually turned into a really strong, uh, really strong recruiting theme. So I would say, you know, the, the receptionist program through these kids coming through Cosmo schools before they graduate and then word of mouth and some of the circumstances that we've already discussed. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. I love that. And it, it's all organic. Uh, that's the beauty of it all. And, and, and it's, and it's helping the business to thrive. Well, uh, yeah. So let's touch on that just a minute. So we came back from COVID and we'd been closed. We had to reopen a lot of staff for everybody didn't come back because they were worried about COVID and all those other kinds of things. Yeah. Our core group came back. They just said, I'm, I'm ready to go back to work. I need to get back. We know you guys are going to protect us with, you know, sanitation and all the other things that went with us. So we're coming back. So our core group came back. We have been able to track over the years that when somebody goes on life insurance, which we offer, or somebody goes on health insurance, the incidence of them staying with us long term goes up exponentially. So yeah. when we got all of those people back, they knew this was their home and where they needed to be. So our core group came back. Of course, churn, right? There's some of them that didn't, some of them that, that will never come back for a variety of reasons because they got other offers or whatever the case might be. But that core group came back. They recognized that we were short staffed. So their efficiency went up. They actually, literally, we didn't suggest this, but they shortened their breaks. They, they stay on the floor doing their thing more often because they are really driven by passion to take better care of their clients who are waiting longer than they used to and to perform at a different level for us as employers because we've gone overboard to help them through this whole process and give them rewards you know for facing the facing the tiger which we're going through right now and that kind of stuff i mean we send flowers to them at the salon for everything that you know new babies birthdays anniversaries all those kinds of things we really make them understand that they're part of our family. We literally call it a family. So that's that's kind of us. I love that. The fact that the employees on their own invest back into the business, right? That's 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 powerful. Uh, let's talk for a minute, because I know we, you know our time's a little limited today, but I, I, we got a few minutes left. So one of the things that impressed me the most when we first met and we're chatting, Jerry, was was some of the kind of, I'd say, visionary things you're thinking about doing. Do you mind talking about that for a little bit? Okay, you know, we're, you're offering benefits and, and, and life insurance and things that a lot of salons don't offer uh, for their stylists, right? Because it's a cost. Sure. That's, that's like child's play compared to some of the stuff you're doing. Tell us a little <laughs> bit about some of the challenges that you've seen with your family, your employees there, and how you're trying to take care of them. Well, you know, uh, again, staffing and COVID and all the headaches most employers have faced, 
one of, uh, we deal with a lot of uh, single moms and, and certainly if they're not single moms, they're still moms and they have daycare issues. And that, you know, during uh, actually last summer, I was brainstorming on the issues that keep people from working the number of hours they really need to work in order to make the income they need and so on and so on and so forth. And um, did some research with some of our staff and daycare continued to come up as number one. So I spent about six months working on different platforms where we could subsidize daycare, we could do this or that or the other thing. Well, at the end of the day, we bought a daycare center. Mm -hmm. And through that daycare center, we're going to offer our staff who have children, uh, not only subsidized daycare for the, um, for the uh, positions that we've kept open for children of our staff to be in, but also instead of sending their kids across the street to stay with a neighbor who puts them in front of a TV with a peanut butter sandwich during the day just to get them out of the way, they're going to a full-fledged, fully accredited daycare with teachers who actually are taking their children uh, to a different level from an educational standpoint, from a care standpoint, and those kinds of things. So we are we are going to we put our own money on the line. We've invested heavily in this. Um, I mean, of course, it's a it's already a daycare that's got clients and will continue to get fully paying clients. But a portion of it is going to our staff so that we can. Uh, bring those kids up and in, in a little better situation than they've got right now. And we're extending the hours of that daycare center because we work retail hours so that our staff can take kids in earlier or leave them later, whatever they have to do, not only to work for us, but if they have something going on in their life where they need to, you know, take care of it before they go to work or whatever. So um, we've, we're doing that in one location, which is pr our primary market right now. And once we um, judge how um, accepted it is by our staff, how many of them use it, how excited they are about it, then we're going to roll it out into every market where we have locations because um, first off, daycare is needed everywhere in America right now. And if we can do something to facilitate that for our staff that leads into helping other people too, um, that's a win all the way across the board. So that's the biggest thing we're working on right now. I got a couple other things that are very unusual that I'm working on that I think will help. But, you know, for instance, housing. I'm yeah. working on something right now where I can uh, provide better housing for some of my staff, at least in transition or something like that. So um, I'm trying to think outside the box and become the employer's choice for things that ultimately won't cost me much money, mm -hmm. but to them changes their complete life. And that's really what it's all about, Dan. Yeah. Well, Jerry, I love it. I think we should wrap on that thought that, that uh, in the end, in the end, when you're able, as an employer, I think all of us have some some uh, responsibilities to take care of people, right? We're given a bit of a stewardship as we can build a successful business. And, sure. uh, but in the end, uh, the way that we take care of people also reflects on the way that people will take care of us and take care of right. our clients, which is really the goal of the business, right? To attract and to grow a business by taking care of clients, servicing them in a way that makes them not want to leave. And the same thing should be a focus of a business on employees uh, and that that ultimately results in in a better operating business happier employees better customer experiences all these things that we spend money on books and we go to conferences to learn about i feel like it's a lot simpler in the end than a lot of people try to make it. i don't need an expensive technology platform to help me measure customer satisfaction if i if i'm taking care of them i already know what their satisfaction is but i can measure and, and grow but I don't have to, I can, I can invest in other things that are a true benefit to the customer and to my client and to my employees. Sure. When you're investing in your employees, it's going to show up on the bottom line through your customer base and all of those kinds of things. It's, it's kind of a reverse metric that most business owners don't take time with. But I got to tell you, if we had more time or on another show or something like that, I would love to tell stories about individuals that I can take you from you know, describe what they looked like the first time that I saw them or some of the situations they found themselves in early in their employment with us. And then fast forward three or four or five years and show where they're at now in life. And it is, you know, to me, it literally gets my heart going right now telling the story because um, we completely change their life and the lives of their children and their grandchildren and all those kinds of things. And it was through such simple things, Dave. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I would love that. That would be a fun. Let's 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 uh, we'll schedule some time outside of this, and we'll do another episode just to talk about the impact uh, of this kind of a, an approach. But Jerry, thank you so much. I appreciate you coming and sharing, and I also just appreciate the way that you've lived your life, uh, and and 
kind of set an example that it's unique uh, in a way here that I think we can, we can, you can revolutionize the way people think about it if we get the word out. So thanks for joining us to do that. You bet. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, you're welcome. Bye, Jerry.